doing great, and uh, I'm glad to be back. It's the new TMT where we're going to do Grill the Expert. It's a new concept where we bring a bring an expert in, and oh, you and I really? well, let's put them on the grill. Who's going to be today? Let's grill, let's get somebody in today. Well, I think that would be great. I didn't make any phone calls, so I'm going to have to grill you. That's the uh, that's the grill we're going to wait, wait use you as the expert. <laughs> this, so a what fake is it? Head move right there. What, in case you're wondering, what is it? You're an expert <laughs> in is the first question. It's mental health, right? Yeah. Well, no, I I I, um, I can't claim expertise in just about anything. I'm just day to day. But um, I've been around a lot of mental health professionals, and I do have a couple of degrees, um, and I taught there. So I guess that makes me somewhat knowledgeable, but uh, let's don't go too far in that direction because well, well, these got, would be my opinions. You've got another show here at Columbus Media Group yeah. on the Columbus Podcasting division of Columbus right. Media Group, and that's Got Therapy, right? So you're the interviewer. And Dan Ross is the... Dan Rose, yes. Dan, I mean, Dan Rose, that's right. Yeah, he is yeah. the... Uh, well, Dan Ross might be somebody we want to Dan grill Dan Ross would be thing. a good... He'd be good to grill on on the state of publishing and uh, oh, literature. Yeah, he'd like be good. Guy. Let's, yeah, let's, Dan let's, Rose is the got therapy. Yeah, guy. yeah, Dan. And um, But let's... I like your idea. So you're going to make a list of folks we're going to bring in and grill on the various uh, issues that they know about. Got list. I... Got a list. Already, already a got secret a list. list. Had a panel of experts devise a list of, of expertise across the, I guess the region that we were. All right, I bring like, them I in. like the I like the fact that you've worked on this with the list, and unfortunately, you have chosen me as the person well, you're going to start with. So the uh, panel of experts. The panel of experts you know, came up with this. Columbus Media okay. Group has a panel of experts that we consult <laughs> on every issue. And, in fact, they devise the questions we're going to have today. Okay. I'm not going okay. to improvise questions. I'm going okay. to, okay. I'm going to uh, read the questions as written. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let's see how this works. I don't know if I'm ready. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure I'm not ready. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to do what I can do here and we'll have a conversation after all, you know, listen, this has been the idea of Columbus podcasting is just for people to have a conversation. I think that's the most important thing. And if it helpful, if it's helpful to someone else or they want to join in and that, that, that'll achieve its mission right there. Well, the concept today, the theme, if you will, is emotional and spiritual health in this millennium, this new millennium. Right. And uh, I think you and I began working on concepts like these as far as the publication and uh, the uh, broadcasting Mm -hmm. maybe close to 20 years ago. Yeah, it was quite a while back, and I thought we we brought in um, all kinds of issues that that you had read something or I had read Mm -hmm. something. I remember several, you know, even had the Grateful Dead and leadership style in there. That's right. That's right, some uh, counterintuitive things. Yeah, Yeah. and uh, get it, get Mm -hmm. it done. The the idea of the book, the guy said how to to figure out how to be more efficient in your day-to-day activities. Steve Jobs leadership. Yeah. We did that. So, so those are interesting. This is a continuation of it, but it seems like we're now in a new millennium. It's a, so, it's, yes. There's been a lot of change over those 20 years. So, there has been. So, well, I don't know if I'm ready for this, but I tell you what, why don't we just start and see where we go? All right. You ready for question one from our panel of experts? All right, your panel of experts. Okay, go. Given the ubiquity of and rapid expansion of communications capabilities. Right. How, what is the effect on the human being now? And um, maybe talk about some coping strategies. Okay. Well, uh, that's kind of a, that's a broad question in a sense, because if you're asking about um, this, this uh, communication age that we're in now, then it brings in a lot of factors because you have to talk about technology. You have to yeah. talk about the impact of technology on us in our lives. You have to talk about just environmental ideas and issues that impact uh, an individual. Well, I, I don't, by the way, let me just as a disclaimer, I don't think any of my answers are going to be the answers. It's just my answers. So uh, I'll, I'll try to. <laughs> 
I'll try to go where this this conversation. No, we were us. looking for something to take to the bank for our emotional and our spiritual health. Okay. And now you're hedging. You're yeah. hedging your answer already. Uh, yes, I am, and I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, proud to mention that and say it out loud. But but yeah, let's get back to it. I, I think the idea of communication uh, and the way it's changed so much in just recent years that we're all on the grid. People talk about. Uh, being tethered to their phone. Um, yesterday, I left my phone uh, at the house, and I made a little trip out, and I got back, and there were eight phone calls. People were from the same person trying to call me eight times. Um, that that example right there is, well, I felt guilty. I felt bad about that. The phone was, I didn't, I just had forgotten. But then uh, the person was really trying to get in touch with me and needed to talk with me. So... So you the, felt the, guilt because you're you weren't available, right? Exactly, and I think um, that that is just a small example of how yeah. connected we are, particularly to our cell phones uh, right now. Because if you look at communication, think about it in the old days when uh, thirty years ago, and uh, uh, somebody called on the phone, or more than that, probably. You'd have you'd have a phone tethered to the wall, plugged in to yep. the wall. You'd have to go to the room where the telephone was, pick it up, and you wouldn't know who it was. There was no caller ID, and you just had to say hello, and they would tell you who they are. And we we would kind of go from that. Uh, well, uh, th- those are the, or you could just let it ring and, and it, maybe get it. Or back. if you weren't home, it just rang. And it rang just and rang, rang, and rang, and rang. No rang. answering machine. No answering machine. None so of that was available. folks were out of luck. Hey, he's not home. I'm not getting an answer. Well, I think that's gone away now because uh, every individual just about, and and kids start at an early age too, parents getting them phones because the other kids have phones, and that's an issue with parenting in in lots of ways too. But I think... uh, that the the that's just one example that we technology has sort of forced us to be connected, and therefore um, we're always on. It's always on. So when you talk about mental health and other uh, issues about how well we're doing, then that's going to have an impact yeah. on us. Either my forgetting the phone is a small example, but the idea that. Uh, we suddenly don't have any personal time away from that to sort of sort things out, think about things, figure out some of the bigger issues in our lives, uh, settle on that without all of this constant interruption that we have. So from that perspective, just the the use of technology and the cell phone that's impacted our lives, I think it's had a has a major impact that we have to cope and we have to figure out some coping skills with that and a lot of people have said you know take some time to put the phone down in fact i've got an app that talks about mindfulness and and meditation yeah. and that kind of thing uh it basically pops up just and it'll pop up a, a little statement on that it says um can you let go of your phone can you put your phone down now and just uh wow. enjoy the moment where you're at and it's but you reminder. have to be reminded by your phone it's reminded by the phone so it's <laughs> kind of a one of those <laughs> to be double, healthy uh, to be mentally healthy <laughs> <laughs> it's a reminder to do what you need to do yeah. um yeah so <clears throat> i i think um one coping uh, skill right away, I think, is to take time out where you're not c- connected all the time. Yeah. You know, settle some things out so you can have a few minutes. Do that meditation. Do do some of the mindfulness training th- stuff that we'll talk we'll talk about, and uh, and really kind of enjoy life and not let the technology and what what comes with that that the impact of technology is the stress that it brings, that you have to be available, that you have to have an answer, you have to be engaged. And it's simply not not true all the time. Yes, we do sometimes, but not all the time. So the idea is that you have to have some balance um, between work and play, if you will. I think Freud wrote about this very early on in some of the volumes that he talked about mm-hmm. and the significance of play or time away from that work. And so the issue for me is balance, that we, 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 yeah, there's times to go to work and be on the grid and do the work that we have to do, and there's time for us to kind of disconnect. So that's, that's really the first thing that I think of um, when, when you talk about communication. But, if, but 
going on a, a little further, I think <clears throat> the, the idea is actually a positive idea that we've been able to connect and get information. This has been the information age, and as we've, we are now more, um, w- w- we have uh, more information available to us to make better decisions. So I frame that, and in, and in therapy we call it reframing, but the yeah. idea that we frame this in a positive way as well. So now I can look up all the newspapers in the country on my phone or right, tablet right. or computer. Yeah. I can get different opinions about things. I can research now. I mean, everybody Googles, right? The old That's Google, right. Uh, uh, the YouTube phenomena, which we uh, this, this uh, podcast is on and others, is the idea that if you need information about a particular topic or even need to fix things, you can find a right. YouTube it's, video yeah. where someone has posted that video fixing that sink dripping water That's or right. engine yeah. or yeah. carburetor on my tiller at one point in my gardening. And uh, that, that, that availability of information is like never before. We're in this age, which I think is very, very positive. It gets back to how you balance that, your coping skills with it. But nevertheless, that information is is valuable and it and it's enriched our lives. So I think that I want to frame that as just a positive uh, way to look at at the communication. Could it be there's too much information that that you're always hooked in that there's whatever disaster is happening you're aware of it and is is there an advantage to not knowing some of these things? Well, yes, I, I would say yes. There is an advantage to it. But I also want to want to say that you know, as we learn more coping mechanisms with this, we can we can uh, meet that challenge yeah. of these different ideas that maybe even conflict with ours, uh, different opinions, and appreciate difference differences in opinions. Maybe the reframing that you mentioned. Yeah, I, I think so. It's not like I. Uh, yeah, the, it, it becomes a the challenge when you find out that what you believe, for example, may not be completely correct. And yeah. now you've got a different, yeah. uh, you know, you've got some information from different sources that are actually saying, hey, you, you've left out this part or you didn't think about this. And now you have to deal with that in a way um, that works for you. Uh, so that that idea of too much information, yep. yeah, the answer is yes, there is too much information. And you have to filter that information to, to help yourself. Yep. Um, and as an individual, yeah, you can turn that phone off as we just talked about, or you can get away from the grid. But you do have to learn some coping about what happens when there is a conflict of information or many different views of the same issue. And where do you you land? It may challenge your own ideologies, your own belief system, other kinds of things that that you thought were in place. Yeah, yeah. And it's to a certain extent, it's disruptive. And we we've heard that word used quite a bit mm-hmm. these these past year or so. So I think uh, finding a way to to manage that disruption in a way that it's not completely disruptive to you. Uh, or your family, or people around you. Yeah, and it's a feedback mechanism. So it's holding up a mirror to you, and and maybe you're uh, taking a look at your own your own viewpoints, and hopefully you don't just go to the to the internet communications channels that reinforces everything you always know. That that you're you're able to. Uh, look at that feedback in the same way if you're a musician you're able to listen to your own recordings some some folks don't want to because oh, no, because, because you yeah. realize you're not what you have invented in your mind well and you have to you you have to do something to to meet your expectations it's yeah, feedback I, I right think, i think you're right because it's like the first time you hear your voice uh, when you you do that little uh uh, uh thing on the telephone where you leave your message your voice message there and you hear your voice and you go wow i didn't know i sounded like that right. that sounds awful and you have this reaction to it right well um 
I think that that is true, it, it, and that is the adjustment uh, to that new information, uh, and it's an ongoing process, I would imagine, and and uh, and I think that's good because one, in one way we have to step up to to cope with this. We have to integrate different information, maybe contrary information. Uh, and make sense out of it. I mean, our main job is to make sense out of this and make good decisions for ourselves and uh, in this situation. So I think the general concept of all of this information is good, but you have to have a strategic plan to manage it throughout the day, if not the year, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and moment to moment in some cases. Yeah, talk with Mike and Tom here at Columbus Media Group, First Avenue, Columbus, Georgia. We're talking about spiritual and emotional health in the new millennium, and we're talking with uh, Dr. Michael Baltimore, who is our first expert on Grill the Expert on this uh, this programming format. So my second question, okay. and really we talked about a panel of experts. The panel of experts was me sitting at a Brewster's ice cream. And uh, so uh, the second question is that organized religion has long been a cornerstone, if you will, of of spiritual health and and spiritual practice, especially in the Western world, everywhere. But uh, I I think of uh, our traditional uh, religions here in the United States and uh, Europe uh, a lot of times, and there are other other practices. Especially in the West, organized religion is maybe not as prevalent, especially in this new era where people say they're spiritual, but they practice— on their own right so what where are we going with us spiritual practice and uh what about the assurance and emotional health that organized religion brought and maybe at this point not so much in in uh in the west anyway well i i think it may be related to your first question about communication and data and the information and sharing of that information that people who once and had their community very sometimes very small communities sometimes a little bit larger but that that uh, the beliefs and the thoughts and everything sort of lined up and now you're getting these sort of contradictory ideas or different types of viewpoints on spirituality and religion uh, again back to what we just said is sort of coping with that in a certain way and understanding uh, but being open to new ways of looking at things. I think that's a challenge. Um, so uh, this is a very big question. I certainly want to disqualify myself from being able to, to really give a good answer to this, this type of question, but I, I do believe there's, there's lots of change in the area of religion and spirituality yeah, and the, yeah. the things that people hold on to as valuable to them. Um, there's a growing population of non-believers in the U.S. They say it's a fast-growing 23% or so yeah. of people wow. who are not yeah. affiliated. I didn't realize it was Yeah, it's, 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 it's growing, and, and I think that's telling us something about how people are beginning to um, kind of figure out how to hold on to the beliefs that are valuable to them and what what is important in their lives and how religion teaches us uh, to how to live our lives and how to deal with with, yeah, with yeah. people and things like that and and so I think those are those are kind of the valuable things. Uh, there's been some questions about uh, you know the traditional religions and I think we've seen it. Uh, go in different directions, I, I think, uh, uh, is sometimes uh, abused. And mm-hmm. uh, my mother used to refer to the television preachers yep. that, that yep. wanted you to send in money sometimes. And we had these long discussions about really what what's behind that and what are they doing, as opposed to the church that we always went to and what was going on in that. And it seems right. like, okay, now we got this spectrum or this continuum of different types uh, yeah. of how people uh, present and use religion in a way. So there's all kind of caveats here, I think, and I think a person has to to really spend some time on their own um, on their own in their own time to figure out what their beliefs are, because sometimes I think these beliefs 
can be challenged by this new information age that we that we've talked about, and it may be uncomfortable. It may make make people question what they've always believed and why they believe it. And I think that's the key that people in this in this this day and age, if you will, allow me to say that, that there is a um, a, a questioning of sort of finding the truth. Yeah. What what's real? What did I want to? So one person said, "I want to believe more true things. Yep. The most um, it, as many true things as I can in this in this world. Yeah. And it and it takes some self examination, and you have to kind of go back and look at what's what's really valuable to you, and it'll challenge a belief in the spirituality sense. Yep. That you may have held on to, and like we talked about a few minutes ago. It is a challenge that you have to resolve as an individual. This is, this is down to the individual level, uh, and what gives you comfort, and what gives you hope, and what helps you move to a, a place that you want to be. That examination of your beliefs, I think, is crucial in lots of ways, and we don't often get to our belief system. Right. I think some of the psychotherapists have talked about that, and. The cognitive behavioral people, for example, believe that, uh, and they, I've, I've heard people use the analogy of an onion, that our, that our beliefs are the core of that onion. And to really get at that, we have to peel back the layers. And in psychotherapy, what happens, and part of the process in that particular model, is for people to examine what they're thinking on a day-to-day basis, what right. words they use, what what kind of the flow of consciousness, what are they talking about, how are they talking about it. And then with a psychotherapist, they can have these conversations, and the therapists are, are really looking for links to the belief that a person holds. So, you, for example, you might say, well, you know, I'm just not good with math. And they say mm-hmm. that, you know, you mm-hmm. have a conversation. You've heard yeah. people say yeah. that. No, I'm not, I just don't math. I just me either. Right. don't get along, blah, blah, blah. Right. The therapist might drill down into that a little bit and get you to talk about it and open that up and maybe find out that you're not that bad at math, but you're holding on to a belief that you feel right. is rational and true, and it may not be. Yeah, uh, their therapists say that's an irrational belief because all the evidence points to you being okay with math, as, an, as our example. Yeah. And so, the change process in psychotherapy, through that particular model, is to listen to the words that identify with the beliefs, and then to open up open up the discussion for the beliefs to be brought out in the conversation, and really examine it because you may be pretty good at math turns out oh you do your own taxes every year oh you run a business Mm -hmm. wait a minute why are you saying you're bad at math right the evidence doesn't fit so and that's just an uh, an example but the idea is to examine those belief those long-held beliefs and i think getting back to your question about religion and spirituality Yes, because the tradition in religion, for example, has been we in our, in our community, in our region, and maybe in in, in America generally, that as children you were t- taken to church. Your, That's right. Your parents taught you. They their parents taught them, and back and That's forth. Right. And now in this information age, you get all these kind of conflictual ideas. You get comparative religions, for yep. example. That's right. That. Uh, my God versus your God. Right. Uh, uh, m- my my congregation. Again, I mean, it gets to that point. Also, I think we need to make a distinction between the re- religious the, um, idea and the spiritual idea. I think a lot of people spirituality. When you use the word spiritual now, it can um, be connected to sort of that new agey. Um, crystals and, yeah. and uh, sp- you know, those kinds of uh, those kinds of ideas, which you can tell by by my reaction about what I think about it. But 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 that um, if it's if it's a if it's comforting for someone, then yeah, they, people may glom onto it. I think people are looking and searching in their in their lives to f- the sense to find that core, to find that that balance, and the, and to find themselves and and 
examined their their life. They talked about a unexamined life not being. Uh, so so with that exploration, and by the way, psychotherapy um, is about discovery and explanation and, mm-hmm. and exploration. I mean. To get to the explanation, maybe, but but uh, that's something that we all have to undertake. I think it's an individual quest. I think that's what we have to do. We have to figure out what is is important to our lives. Sometimes we have to sort out things that we just don't believe in anymore, like we used to, maybe. Right. And that's tough for folks because that that ostracizes you in some ways from others. But you have to do that on an individual basis, and I really think. That's a it's a it's a worthwhile effort, and you have to be careful that you you don't uh, go too far out and kind of let go of some of those important beliefs that you think are, are valuable to you and the way you live your life. And actually, that's what it's about: just how do you live your life with and and how do you where and how do you use that support that religion uh, brings to people. So any thoughts about why this is taking place now, why this is happening now? I know going back to the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and the Scientific Revolution, there were a lot of questions, and it transformed how organized religion practiced, really, because because some of the things that people believe they were shown through various... Uh, various things that uh, maybe maybe it's different than what you may have originally thought. So why now is this sort of seems sort of wild west and a free for all in a way? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting way to 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 put it. I, I, sometimes some days I think the whole existence is uh, the wild west that yeah, we're dealing with yeah. on, on multiple levels. Um, yeah, I. I I don't know exactly, but the idea of the industrial age, as you mentioned, but now the technology and information yeah. age, um, we know more through science, and, yeah. and sometimes people will pit science against religion, and that I don't find that very helpful uh, from my point right. of view. But the, but the idea is that, yeah, we, we're learning more, and uh, some of the ideas from religion because they're so far in our past that uh, uh, that, that we've held on to, get challenged by a new idea yeah. uh, and new information, and and that's the only answer that I, that I have is that we're exposed to ideas that challenge what we once believed. Right, it's that feedback loop again. It's exactly. expanded, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and I and that that's something that's that's kind of. That's life, if you allow me to say that. But that, that, <laughs> yeah, right. that's, uh, yeah, yeah. that's how that's the thing that we have to figure out and, and give meaning to our lives. Now there are um, theories, and ca- I, when I say theories, I'm talking about counseling and mental health theories that are really change theories to help a person change and improve and work work through through issues. There are some that say uh, life has no intrinsic meaning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I remember saying that in class, and students kind of the eyebrows went up, and they, right. they said, and and we had a discussion about the idea that this particular theory says that we give meaning to life. That's it's right. It's what you put, you know, put out and and begin to understand and believe and and carry on in your in your life. So, so many different ways to look at how we under, come to understand who we are. And and um, the existential questions of why, what's the purpose of life, and all those. Right. And I'm not going to attempt to answer that question, Tom. You can ask me a million times. I'm not going to answer the meaning of your life today. Maybe next week. I don't know. Yeah, but there is some comfort in in having an entity or an organization or a boss or whatever sort of laying down the guidelines for you and so when you get up in the morning you know well here's here are the lines this is this is there's some comfort but also you're automatically restricting yourself when you go that route and there's freedom the other way but it takes a lot of courage too doesn't it i i would think so and i i think that the you know the the big questions that i've 
oftentimes in watching podcasts and and getting information as we talked about i'm a consumer information yeah. consumer yeah. uh quite a bit and that that people have had these discussions that are very deep discussions about the beginnings of life and the universe and how the universe began and the big bang and god and creation and yeah. all of those issues and and i think um this that those examples i think are things that have been brought to the forefront that we never discussed before these are new uh, i mean yeah these ideas have been around but i think now we're it's people are talking about these more and there are more challenges for people uh there seems to be a willingness life. maybe and, and and that's probably a healthy thing right oh i think i think so i think the the uh the openness to the experience that we have and making sense out of it yeah uh and i think adler was right when he talked about this notion that we give meaning to life and to the things that we do right um and w- develop the kind of person that you want to be uh, over over time, and that that uh, that's a challenge that we all have to meet. I yeah. think uh, there's no no way around that. But I think the 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 problem issue, if I may just talk about that for a second, is that what we we've seen where the the dogma that comes with some religions yep. have conflicted so much. We've gone to war, right? We, we yeah. fought battles. That's right. You know, and it's been going on for centuries. Uh, and even though that uh, Stephen Pinker talked about that, there's less violence in the world now than That's ever right. before. He, he he tends to affirm the the arc of justice is long, but you know that whole idea, the, yeah. but that it trends upward. Pinker uh, actually has data to show that. Yeah, I, I I think that's amazing to when you first hear it. Like, wait, I see on the news how terrible people that's blowing right. up things and uh, all this crime and uh, and 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 uh, bad behavior basically. But but yeah, he he presents a very different side of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the the old the old aphorism I can't remember who said it, but that life is nasty, brutish, and short for so many <laughs> eons. That was true, right? <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, uh, that's a. Yeah, that 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 statement kind of brings you around a little bit there, uh, but yeah. I'd, so those are th- those are the challenges I think that we have to have as individuals. I believe that's an individual quest. I don't think that's a group uh, quest. I think um, I, I have a different opinion about that than than some about uh, sort of the group and the and getting your ideas from the group. I think it's up to you as an individual to work through where you're at in those those challenges. And what what has meaning to you? Um, <clears throat> but that may that's a very Americanized uh, way to look at things, I think. And uh, uh, but uh, that that's that's kind of how I, I see it. But that's a that's a great question, and I don't know if I answered your initial question at all. Uh, but that's that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, I think I think uh, there's there are a lot of a lot of ways to. To sort of examine that whole thing, and and you were talked earlier about about reframing. Yeah. It's it's best to possibly to frame in a positive way. So what what's good in this? What's healthy in this? And can we can we grab hold of that rope rather than than the uh, rope that's the unhealthy rope? Which one of the things you mentioned, uh, and we're uh, at talk with Mike and Tom on. First Avenue at Columbus Media Group. Uh, we're uh, uh, grilling the expert. This week's expert is Mike Baltimore, Dr. Michael Baltimore. Dubious. Me- mental yeah. health expert. Yeah, we, uh, you, you talked a little bit about sometimes something that's very well-intentioned, like organized religion, can can end up placing people on different ends of a spectrum where they, where they in fact, have uh, come up with violent conflict. And I wanted to maybe move a little bit into the idea of uh, of politics and politics. I'm looking at... Okay, now we're about to get in trouble, aren't we? Okay, uh, yeah, we I'm looking at politics in the United States and also uh, also globally. There seem to be some global trends. So the the two trends that I'm thinking about, and, and again, this could be conventional wisdom, maybe not true, but the conventional wisdom is that never have there been more clear-cut divisions 
in political orientation. And, uh, you know, the term it could be liberal, conservative, left and right. That's one trend is that people may be getting more and more intransigent in their viewpoints to where there is no middle ground, no re- resolution. And then the second trend in politics, and this appears to be something that's also global, is this move toward toward a, maybe a hyper-nationalism. In other words, uh, uh, something that could be healthy. I support my government. I support my nation. I support my neighbors. Now becomes uh, us and them at, to the exclusion of everything else, that, that it's all about this country and uh, makes everything hyper competitive and especially in an economy where all our interests are really because of technology tied together that seems to be create a dialectic sort of you know here one one in one sense we're all connected in the other sense we're totally disconnected so if that's true I don't know that it's true, but if it's true, wh- where does the regular, regular old human being like me? What what do I, what do I do here in order to cope with this and find some comfort level with this discussion? Well, wow, that's that's a big question, and you're right. It is, um, it's it's a major question that we need to answer for our nation, uh, particularly. And you mentioned nationalism, so I think there's a lot to to sort of unpack from from your your question. And um, I, I I got a couple ideas, and I, I, and I, it kind of goes back to something that I, I I talked about just a moment ago. But it has to do with um, the psychological concept of uh, confirmation bias that. W- our group believes a certain thing, and this is the ideology, and this is what we hold on to. Yeah. And anybody that does not believe that is on the outside of the group. So, uh, for me, that's always the dangerous, the danger uh, within this that uh, we feel so entrenched, so righteous in our beliefs that the others are wrong, and we're not open to hearing a different side and a different yep. uh, viewpoint. And m- I might add, uh, a core counseling uh, value is the idea of empathy, to look, in, to look at it right. from another person's right. point of view. Yeah. And in this, um, the frame that you just laid out, that doesn't occur very often. You're with us or you're against us. Right. Um, I'm sure somebody quoted that somewhere. I don't remember that. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> someone from the past, but that was the the phrase. And um, that's problematic in a way because do you really have all the best ideas in your camp? Do you are you oh, really good, good right point. about yeah. everything? And yeah. is it should be exactly this way and there's no give there's yeah. no compromise and you know we we talk i think we talked about this at one point the idea of compromise has gotten a bad rap it's a bad label right right that you compromise oh now you're a flip-flopper or something oh, in that right in that that's way a, th- that at one time that may have been a strength finding that middle ground now it's oh, yeah. you you it still you, is by the way you don't have uh you don't have the courage of your convictions. You flip flopped. You you caved. You gave in. All those terms we use. Yes, and wow. I mean, that's that's a form and and uh, of shame of shaming. And and Dan Rose, had, we had a whole episode uh, with Dan, the psych psych psychologist, talking about the idea of shame and how shame, it's used, yeah. and and uh, it's used in parenting it's used throughout and now it's become sort of a national thing if you can if you say something against my ideology then we'll come back and shame you or even to the worst side of humanity we start name calling and doing all of these other kinds of things that break down some of the most important concepts of how we should live our lives from a mental health point of view i think it's really detrimental that that we don't have and don't allow ourselves to compromise hear other opinions and still and work toward working together living together uh 
so the political world has sort of um, uh, really uh, just exploded uh, our and challenged us to understand that uh, uh, it, it's challenged people to be in one camp or the other so yeah. with that divide. Yeah. But the greater challenge is where do we have similarities and where do we bridge things together and where can people... I mean, the average American out there could care less about some of all of this new stuff that uh, we are bombarded with constantly, what the president said, for example, or what this congressperson said about right. something. And, and uh, w- we just want to have a, a good life yeah. in general yeah, and, right. and take care of our kids and raise our kids and go to work and pay our bills and take a vacation and celebrate the 4th of July, <laughs> all of these kinds of mm-hmm. things and in this country. Uh, and the nationalism does that on a much larger scale. What it does is, besides just the political parties, now we're going nation versus nation. Yeah. And that's going to set up a terrible scenario um, and, and that we're not partnering and working with, with other countries. So the nationalism also has some very... Uh, I'm not sure of the word for the, for this, but um, dark uh, beginnings. Uh, if you if you look at that, uh, the tribalism and the nationalism has been connected to some very nefarious, difficult, and harmful um, regimes from the past that is sort of s- associated with that. Um, and it's a two. It's a T- double-edged sword because on the one hand y- you aren't you proud of your country and being a member of this nation uh, and uh, the other side is uh, if you don't then you're with them as I said earlier and it it uh, it, it absolutely provides no opportunity for you to hear the other speak in other words you're so right, encamped right. and so in uh, in 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 turned into this this belief system that there's no way to even consider the others' yep. opinion or views. I think it's very dangerous. I think it's dangerous for individuals. I think it's dangerous for the country to do that as well. But again, these are opinions uh, from me, and that's that's <laughs> that's the only way I know how to answer that question. So, looking at it <clears throat> from the from the a point of view. It uh, uh, from a mental health point of view, it goes against some of the some of the values that we hold for people to be to be congruent in what yeah. you believe and think and act, how you act, uh, to be empathic and use empathy and understand the other's point of view, and to be authentic who you who you are. And early on, we talked about challenging beliefs, that that's part of life, that your beliefs get challenged. Now, right. are you going to fight about that every time somebody says something different? Well, that's all about it? growth. That's yeah. uh, the child interacting with with the environment and growing because of the feedback that's coming from the environment. You touch a stove, you get burned. Well, right. Well, uh, yeah, or, uh, you know, any of a number of things where you're learning. You, you know, we're, we're talking about this whole thing about discourse and empathy and that kind of thing. It seems like a lot of the di- discourse right now, anyway, sure. is geared toward outrage. In other words, yeah. that when you turn on any kind of opinion or news or anything, it it depending on the orientation of the of the organization the group, doing yes. that, doing the communicating, right. uh, it the reach is always toward outrage. In other words, look at look at what they did. Look at what right. they said. Aren't you angry about that? Aren't you angry yes. about that? And and then the other thing is is maybe almost to me the the co opting of the word evil. They're mm-hmm. evil. Right. Well, that absolves you of a lot of responsibility if 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 the other side is evil, then doesn't that take away their humanity to where that may be a slippery slope we don't want to go down. That's how wars are started. Exactly. In other words, we don't we ascribe every motivation to well it's just ill will and evil. And why? Well they're just evil. Well Right. And it's not just a, seemed, not a very good explanation in, in detail. It just 
kind of go with the feeling. Yeah, if I if I think of my next door neighbor and say, well, they they didn't cut their grass because they're evil, <laughs> then what happens when there's a neighborhood crisis and I need my next door neighbor as a as a friend and helper and ally? Exactly. Well, if if I've made him evil, then you know, and and I think I, I, I'm being sort of silly about the neighborhood no, analogy, no. but. But maybe maybe I'm not being so silly no, because so. because right now we're living in a, a giant spaceship hurtling through through <laughs> space and the climate's going south and everyone's stacked nuclear arms. Well, to me, there needs to be some cooperation to deal with what seem to be just really challenging problems that right now I don't see anybody tackling, you know. Yeah, that that's a that's that's unfortunate in itself. And and I think you brought up a, a pretty important point that relates to the original question of this this po- political side of things and the nationalism and so forth. It's the use of those emotions of fear that I think is at the uh, core of of some of this. In other words, our group is bonded closer together if we're fearful of the others and we paint them in a certain way and in human ways you mentioned and I think that's a that's a very clear way to to put that the 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 idea of invoking fear in someone making them afraid bonds them together in a certain way so I, I think the the downside of this is that these politicians that we're listening to are using that very effectively with their group if you want to be with us you you got to be against the other and look how terrible they are look how inhuman they are and in wars and you you would know that the the idea of painting the enemy as evil uh as not like us, as evil is bad, and on and on, giving them names and so forth helps uh, paint that that picture that we need to do something about them because they're not like us, and we should yeah. uh, be angry about that. Not only fearful, but the fear turns into anger, and then that turns into some behavior, and that can lead all the way up to uh, to war. Yeah. So I, I saw a movie. Uh the other night, and it's a, it's not a brand new movie, but it's a uh, a Brad Pitt vehicle where uh, uh, the name of the movie was Fury. It's about a tank crew, and oh, I was yeah. just watching yes. it for entertainment. But ultimately, as you watch the movie, you realize well, it's really about how do you pra- how as a spiritual being do you practice in this terrible environment, and it it really comes down. It's a a movie that both glorifies heroism and fighting and is strongly anti-war at the same time, in the same way that Saving Pri- Private Ryan was. Right. You, you, you know, in other words, uh, you know, it goes back to the old idea there are no atheists in foxholes and no one fears war more than a professional soldier, really, right. because they know what the reality is. Right, and, and the otherwise it's been painted in a different way for the new recruit and the different people who come in. Right, right. And, and the reality is what the reality is, and it's very clear in the movie what the reality is. And at the same time, even though you have two sides demonizing each other, uh, you know, don't want to be a spoiler, but at the end of the movie, there's a there's an event that transpires that makes us see how we're all connected too, wow. and you're left with right. you're left at the end of the movie with more questions about the very issues we're talking about. But I was I was stunned that the movie was so spiritual when I expected it to to be more uh, just a sort of garden variety uh, shoot 'em up kind right, of thing, right, which right. is what I was looking for. That you had a little like, entertainment. You, you were just trying to yeah. escape with some entertainment that's there, right. but, it, but it challenged you to sort of think about these issues, and I think that's what a good movie does, by the way, is is really embed these ideas and concepts for you to grapple with and kind of come out of the other side of them, and uh, and I think that's what makes a good movie. I really do. I, I think, no, but I, I love the mindless uh, consumption of things just to get... Uh, <laughs> Uh, your mind on that as opposed to something else. Well, so. I mean, my idea was uh, 
uh, my wife had gone to bed, and I was going to watch a little something to make me sleepy and relaxed. Oh, no, and no, all. not that movie. And instead, I've seen that movie. Yeah. And instead, I, I sat up till <laughs> two o'clock in the morning in bed, <laughs> thinking about, wow, that really was meaningful, you know, in a lot of ways. So here at uh, Talk with Mike and Tom, at, and we're with the uh, Columbus Media Group down in First Avenue, Columbus, Georgia. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question. So. Sure sort of as a summary it, with all the things we've talked about and we talked about a lot of things probably too many things this morning but the <laughs> what what do we do as far as self-care uh, with all the messages coming from us from ubiquitous communication devices everything goes on facebook everything's on youtube there's more data than we could ever comprehend how do we take care of ourselves emotionally and spiritually wow. right now. I, you know, I wish I could bottle whatever the real answer was and sell it. Uh, but I, I, to be serious, I, I really think that we have to learn s s the, some coping skills ourselves in the, in the midst of all of this conflict and, and challenges and various challenges that we have in our beliefs and the way we behave and act and talk and all of those things. I think we have to really go through that discovery process where um, we're, we're trying to find out a little bit more about ourselves. And there's lots of ways to do that. So I, I really think some of the basic counseling um, values are something to keep in mind. I mentioned earlier the, the idea of empathy, of looking at it from a different point of view and not being so entrenched in your own beliefs that you're always right because that's a mental disorder if you go too far on that continuum called narcissism <laughs> right and, and right. Uh, you're the center of attention and you have all the great uh, wonderful answers and you you know how to do everything when that's not true for any of us so uh, right yeah. you can't you can't go too far but but to open that door to be open to learning i, I love the way virginia satir talked about it years ago he said you know it's like changing hats you, you take off your judgment hat for just a minute and put on a hat that is open to learning and you really can't learn while you're judging and I, and that stuck with me for for quite a while and I, and the idea that we learn these coping skills and use empathy use the idea of authenticity who be yourself be who you are you've heard this this kind of advice and uh, along the way everybody's heard it but but the idea is really pretty sound that you you, uh, you you examine your beliefs and then you treat people like you want to be treated. That's something that goes back 5,000 years or so. Uh, the do golden unto, rule. Do unto others, of course. And uh, so, but that is, there's some real humanity and truth That's in that. That's right. That's right. And, and, I, and I, we should all value that. And uh, the idea of expertise and gaining expertise and being open to new information is quite a challenge. My, my, my friend Dan says that when you have this emotional disruption or something happens to you uh, that you didn't expect and it shocks you a little bit, and he says that is the moment to sort of lean in. And so the psychotherapy side of it would be that you absorb that shock, if you will, whatever that is that hits you, that's uncomfortable, that's disruptive to you. You allow that to happen, but you don't need to be reactive and respond immediately. That's sort of the uh, quick uh, and probably not so helpful response. He says mm -hmm. that what you do is you feel that shock and you give yourself time to take a breath. You give yourself time to sort of wait, I don't have to answer exactly in this moment. Let me take a deep breath here and just just get a little distance from that emotional moment and then respond and use empathy and, and congruence and authenticity in the way that you understand what the other per where the other person is coming from. And if you practice that in these situations and giving yourself space, it's just really allowing yourself to take a time, a short a moment time out yeah. before you respond. And I don't think people do that. We're too reactive and we're trying to hold on to these ideas and ideologies and not be challenged and will not accept any differences in what we believe. So I think that's one of the first ideas and coping uh, mechanisms uh, that we need to, to kind of put into place. In other words, um, 
And, and I remember it from uh, my kids were boys were young and they'd come in and they'd want to have something immediately. Everybody's doing it in the neighborhood. Yeah. Why can't we go do it? And, yeah. And they wanted an answer immediately. And I, I said, wait, let me think about this. Let me get more information and I'll get back to you. Uh, that that didn't always work. They love that but, answer. But they, they? Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried anyway. Uh, so so it, it is that little bit of a gap in that in that reactivity because I think people are are highly on edge now. They're they're like the PTSD client who is who's triggered by an yeah, event and yeah. and maybe I once said to people and I sort of believed in this idea that we're all dystymic in a way and that's a that's just a mental health term to talk about sort of a low level depression that is everywhere uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in our society and I, I kind of held on to that and no, nobody's challenging me too much on that but but I think in this way it, it is that sort of a low level PTSD uh, yeah uh, that traumatic experience that has happened uh, through all of this information that we are now consuming and coming into our world and that that has led us to be finger on the trigger, uh, reactive in lots of ways. Having said that, I think that we have to have a response to that and we have to be okay with ourselves. And so you, you've, you've, you've talked about uh, and asked a lot of good questions here, and I, I don't know if I've answered any of them, but I, I, but I like the idea that we have to find within ourselves uh, the ability to rise to the challenge. And the way we begin to do that is figure out what we really believe in and what's important to us and how we want to be treated. And then we put that into play. We start acting. So I had a client once who said, I just don't have any friends. How do I get, how do I make friends? I said, well, you, first of all, you become a friend. Mm. And it took a little while to kind of process that, but the idea is, if if you like people smiling at you, for example, smile at them. Smile at them first. Open the door. Be courteous. Just the simple things that, and somebody made that, there was a book. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. the things we learned in kindergarten. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, but, but be kind and, and, um, and courteous. Uh, and, and, it, and I think, um, again, I use the... Uh, uh, reference from Alfred Adler, he says uh, that that life takes courage. Yeah, yeah. and and to to examine your life and then f- figure life takes out courage. Yeah, yeah and yeah. figure out what is important for you, and then actually act in that way. Not let that be just a conversation or something you thought of for a while, and then you go go, but put it into play in your life and start acting like that. And you'll find a lot of friends, and you you you'll have better communication with people when you just come from that that framework. I think that's so important in mental health, and I and I, I hope that uh, people will kind of put that into practice and, and live it, try it out, or give it a trial run, and uh, smile and. Uh, I keep. I, I don't know why I had this flash in my mind, but uh, one of our colleagues, used to, who you know, was a principal at the school, and he he'd get out of his office and walk around school, and he'd see a piece of paper on the on the floor, and he'd pick it up and put it in the trash mm-hmm. can. He says, "When you see something that needs to be done, do it. Um, yeah. Don't wait for something to happen before you move and start that action." So I, I broaden that out a little bit to say, "Yeah, t- be courageous." D- d- Use the principles and the values that you think are important for yourself and what you believe for humanity in a general and broader sense. Put that into play, um, and you'll you'll see the results from that. So I could go on and on, but I think that's that my attempt to answer that question. So let me let me sort of follow up on this, and the sure. la- the last question is going to be the question that is sort of uh, almost, you know, I don't mean to be glib, but it's the give me a template kind of question for what works. But but the things you've talked about, have, be, have empathy, be authentic, then be courageous and take action. That's really sort of a recipe to 
that you could use in maybe answering this last question, okay. which is... I'll probably need some help with this question. Go ahead. The, in the, tw- the 21st century human being, in order to be emotionally and spiritually healthy, looks like what? What is that emotionally and spiritually healthy 21st century being? What is he or she like? That, that really is a challenging uh, question. Um, but I think uh, I'll start with your first question when you asked about the information age and too much information and those kind of things. I think we have to learn. I think we have to be open to learning and we have to become more informed. We have to have that information because that informs us and gets back to sort of managing those beliefs and those actions. So information is good. I've tried to frame that in a positive way. Uh, I think a person in this in this century that you mentioned uh, from your question is um, is thriving uh, to become uh, a better person in lots of ways. They're working. They're they're it's it's they're up to the challenges. And when things go bad, things go wrong. It's not about that. It's about what they do afterwards, and it's lifting yourself up. And, and it's once you fall, it's how you get up and keep moving. So the idea of that type of, I guess if you say ideal uh, person, would be one that can take on the challenges, know who they are in their heart and in the mind, uh, <clears throat> act and, and react in, in the best possible ways, those ways of empathy and congruence and authenticity, and, and be kind uh, and be courteous. Those are simple things, but sometimes we don't see that. We don't see it on the s- screens with all the news programs and the politics and all of that. We don't, we don't see that. Yeah. When somebody says, you know, I, I, your idea is very different from the way I thought about it. Let's talk about that more. It's always the black and white. It's always the uh, zero or one uh, uh, kind of idea, and we we sort of have picked up that and and have run with it of uh, maybe too far now. So, and that's a tough thing because people will say you're right and I'm wrong. You are no, I'm right, you're wrong, and there's no middle ground. That's the challenge. So I think the person, the the, the sort of that image of that person would be someone who can step in the mid, that middle of that zone and say, you both maybe have some good ideas. Let's talk about how we can work out what we need to do and move from there. Well, I've taken some really good notes. I, I think uh, the things that you brought to the table today <coughs> are really, at least for me personally, in a time of change in my life, they're, they're very valuable. I, the questions Thank that you. I asked... Uh, were really existential questions for me personally. They weren't a panel of experts. It was me sitting outside of Brewster's Ice Cream. Now we find out. I thought and, I didn't see that panel of experts around and, here anywhere. And uh, you know, <laughs> that we can't afford them, right? Hey, Columbus Media Group. That's not in the budget. It's a new but, uh, new startup right now. We're trying to get things going. So yeah, we'll have that down the road. But but, but I have to say that, uh, and I've known you a lot of years, but this is maybe one of the more in-depth conversations we've had where we weren't, uh, what is it uh, your wife says, we perseverate yes, and, we and perseverate. Uh, get into She's, the comedy I've side I've been accused of, of that many times of taking but, that joke and just kind of yeah, keeping going with it. Yeah, just stretching it out. Yeah, for, no, it's terrible. But, but I, I th- for me personally, this is very valuable. I hope for our listeners it, it would be too. But I think uh, what I've done is take good notes so it could be that as we put this podcast together, we also have some some summary notes of 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 practices that that are effective, that are time tested, and a couple of the things are are go back millennia. Uh, the the whole idea of the beginner's mind, the whole idea of the golden mean, the whole idea of of uh, seeing our connection. So uh, those. If we live like that, it, it's sort of like some of the things that are said in various organized religions. Geez, if we just follow those, right, uh, we'd be okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I hope some of that's helpful. It's just some of it is just an opinion, and everybody's got a different one. So, um, 
But um, I, I feel like you were pretty fair in grilling me today. So uh, I don't know if, if the tables are going to turn at some point and that my group of experts are going to prepare questions for you as you're in your expertise in leadership. So. First have to find something I'm expert in, and that's, <laughs> a, that's, a, that's a big reach. I don't so, think so. I don't so, think so in that. So anyway, I think uh, I love the format. I think the format will work. Uh, we, we'll be back uh, soon with, uh, with another expert. Sit them on the griddle, grill them hard, <laughs> and this time it'll be both Mike and Tom doing the grilling. We'll tag team on that. So hey, anyway. I think I like that better than being on the hot seat myself but Tom I've enjoyed it thank you for it that was a really good questions by the way and I appreciate the conversation thanks Mike